All right, we've been talking about justification by faith or how to stop sinning. And we talked about all the different methods that modern Christians have used to try to stop sinning. Everything from the principle-based approach to the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. And regardless of what method man has used, whether it's Watchman Knees or Roy Hessians, whether it's uh, some system of dying to self or crucifying the self, or whether it's Bible study and prayer and fasting and casting the devils out of yourself every day, these systems have not worked because they all boil down to self-help programs. They all boil down to a man grabbing hold of resources, even resources given by God, Asking God for strength, granted, but the end result is that he involves himself in working to change the self, working to improve the self by God's grace and help, so that he becomes a fit vessel to express Christ. And that results in failure. That results in as much failure as a man taking the Mosaic law and trying to obey it in order to please God. Just as you cannot be saved by works, you cannot be sanctified by works. There's no more works involved in sanctification than there is in justification. So we pointed out to you in Romans how that you go through Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and there's not a commandment in it anywhere. There's nothing there that Paul tells you to do. First three chapters, he tells you how much of a sinner you are and why you're bankrupt. Then in the latter part of 3, 4, and 5, and the early part of 6, he tells you, here is God's cure for you. Here's what God did in Christ to save you. You come to chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, and even there, there's no commandment. He simply asks the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he answers, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not. And then he goes on to tell us that which we were supposed to already know, that those who were baptized into Jesus Christ, those Christians baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death, and by that, the old man died. The entire old man died. The Adam man died. God crucified the flesh so that it was put off. So that we became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Again, there's no commandment there. Simply a statement that you should know this. That the old man is crucified, buried, raised again, ascended and seated with Christ. That's a fact. No commandment, just a fact. Now, we are going to come to the very first commandment in Romans that tells the Christian what to do. Romans 6, 11. First time he tells the Christian what to do. So our subject this morning is, okay, so I'm dead. I'm buried. I'm resurrected. I am the father of a great nation, as Abraham was. I am a resurrected believer seat on the right hand of God, and sin has no power over me. So do I do nothing? Do I just do nothing? Or is there something for me to do? So all these Christian life methods are things for you to do. The problem with them, they're things for you to do to get in a position to be sanctified. What we're looking at is having been dead, buried, and resurrected, having been sanctified in Christ, the scripture says, now there's something for you to do. Now what do you do? The very first commandment, Romans 6, 11, likewise, in other words, like Christ, like Christ was crucified. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed, not figurative, not allegorically, not positionally, dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the first commandment. So the first thing God tells you to do, think about it. He didn't tell you as a sinner to clean up or stop sinning. Didn't tell you that. Just a statement of what God did with an expectation that that's going to provoke faith in you. Romans chapter 4 and early part of 5. And so having presented that, he finally comes to a statement where there's something for you to do. And he says, likewise, reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. You see, you're not creating anything, initiating anything, instituting anything, or making something active. He said, this is a fact, it's a reality, just believe it like it happened. It's been done. Reckon yourself to be dead. Now verse 12 is the second commandment. Now that you reckon yourself to be dead, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Why? Because the mortal body is dead. And sin doesn't reign in a dead man. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. 
We addressed that issue last week. But if my body's dead, why does it lust? Remember, there's two realities. There's God's reality. Abraham, you're the father of a great nation. And there's Abraham's reality. Abraham, you hadn't been able to in 10 years. What makes you think you can now? So there's Abraham's reality and God's reality. Which one are you going to believe? Abraham believed God's reality, not his own. Now, I believe God's reality that I'm dead. Okay, what do I do if I'm dead? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto God. So, in other words, the commandment is, now that I'm dead, don't allow sin to come back and take this dead body and make it active in sin once again. Don't, don't yield that hand that God says is dead back to the devil to use it stealing. Don't yield these eyes now to look in lust. Don't yield these ears to listen. Don't yield this mouth to taste, drink, or whatever. Don't yield the members of my body to commit sin. Why? Because I am already dead, buried, and alive. Don't yield, but rather yield yourselves unto God. Not to make yourself alive. Not so you'll be dead. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Verse 19. Even so now yield your members servants of righteousness unto holiness. Keep in mind, this yielding follows God's work of destroying sin, destroying the power of sin, and destroying the place where sin dwelt in the human body. In God's reckoning, all that's dealt with, all that's done, Satan's been defeated, and there is no hope sin has on anything in me, according to God. So my job is simply to believe, reckon, and yield. And folks, there's no effort in that. The problem with all the Christian life teachers is they've read all manner of working on the self back into this reckoning and yielding. So the yielding becomes a laborious process of repentance and confession and humility and sorrow and prayer and principles and dedicating your life and a whole pile of work that you must struggle and wade through over a period of years until you get mellowed and sanctified and then you're ready to be sanctified. That's exactly like the sinner doing all these things to get holy and right and get ready so God can save him. Now, Romans chapter 8. Again, no commandments at all in 7. Romans 8. Therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to the flesh. Live after the flesh. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. In Romans, Paul's commandments all have to do with post-resurrection, post-ascension obedience. Now turn to Colossians. We want to labor there this morning. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians is the best summary. Colossians is the best summary of all these things. So we're going to look at it briefly. Beginning in verse 5, 1, 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, wherefore you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Notice the hope, we discussed that, which is in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it in all the world. In other words, the message is come and bringeth forth fruit. What brings forth fruit? The Christian? The message, right? As it doth also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. So he talks about the message itself. The promise, the hope, stirring the faith and bringing forth fruit. And then he says in verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So the first thing in Colossians, Paul said he desires for the Christians who've been through the death, burial, and resurrection is that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will in wisdom and spiritual understanding. Notice that. That's your duty as a Christian. That's your responsibility. Now God, through his word, is ready to pour it out. But it's like when you're in a restaurant and the lady comes up with a pitcher of uh, unsweetened iced tea and she's ready to pour it in your glass. Now if you put your hand on top of the glass, she's not going to pour the iced tea. If you're drinking from it and rattling the ice, she's not going to pour the iced tea. What you do is you reach out and you sit your cup down on the table, uh, usually on the outer edge there, and she will reach over and pour it full of iced tea. Now, there's no great effort on your part except an effort of yielding. 
You see that? You just yield your glass to her. You don't have to fill it up. Just yield it. You don't have to beg her. She's standing there ready to fill it up. All you've got to do is yield your glass and she's going to fill it up with iced tea. Amen. And that's the same thing as a Christian. God's not going to run in and force knowledge of himself upon you. He's not going to run in and, and demand that you develop your spiritual understanding. He's not going to do that. The word of the truth of the gospel comes bringing spiritual understanding. The word of the truth of the gospel comes bringing this enlightenment. But of course you have to yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That requires no great effort. It's just a matter of taking your empty vessel, your empty glass, and placing it on the table and allowing him to fill it. And your cup will run over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. This is not a struggle. This is a faith act. And, you know, I, I remember eating, uh, I think I was eating fish or something. And, and I had my glass, and usually my glass gets greasy when I go out and eat, you know. And, and I've said to the waitress, now be careful, it's slick. I don't want her to pick that thing up and get it half full and it slide out and spill all over my my plate of shrimp or whatever I'm eating, you know. So I said, be careful, it's slick. And so uh, I, I, I've never had one spill it, as slick as I get it. I've never had one of them drop it, but I'm always afraid they will, you know. Now, we're kind of like that when Christ comes to fill us, we'll take our glass and clean it off, you know. Clean it off, then hand it to him. Or say, well, I'm sorry, I've kind of got a little breadcrumbs in here. I don't think you can fill this one up. Well, no, all we do is just hand it over and let him fill it up and keep drinking. Instead of exercising some effort. Now he says back in Colossians again, verse 9, and desire that you might be filled with knowledge of his will and wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. You see, there's still a place for exhortation for Christians. Desire that you walk worthy, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Notice how the fruitfulness is tied to the knowledge of God. Listen, as you know God, as Psalm 910 says this, they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Amen. In other words, as you know God, you trust him. Not know his principles, not know his laws, not know his rules, but know him as a person. You will come to trust in him. Strengthened with all might, he said. Now, folks, that's not God strengthening your might. That's his mind. Strength with all might according to his glorious power. See, that's not God giving you power. That's God's power working unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So God wants us to develop not a personality trait of patience, but this trait of waiting on God and being faithful unto the end. Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father. There's another continued commandment. So that's God's desire for you as a Christian. Think about it. I mean, can you see that this is an overflowing fruit of the work of the Word of God? Being filled with every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, to patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be meet, that means suitable, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Do you realize? that I don't have to do any preparation. He's already made me meet to be a partaker of the inheritance of saints in light. That what God did to make me meet, I was sleeping while it occurred. Where was Adam when God making me help me? He was sleeping. So what, God, what did Adam have to do? See, when I got a wife, I had to work on her a while to get her kind of balanced out. You know what I mean? She couldn't tolerate dirty clothes and unfleshed commodes and spaghetti left in the floor and all kinds of things like that. And so it took me a while to make her tolerate it. But now when God brought Eve to Adam, she was perfectly suited to it. Absolutely perfectly suited to it. Now when God brought me salvation, he did something to me that made me perfectly suited to God. Eve didn't have to come and change herself. She was perfectly suited to Adam. I've been made meet to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. God did that in Christ. He didn't do that in my experience. And then he says, verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy 
and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. How did I get holy, unblameable, and unreprovable? I got that way in the body of Jesus Christ when he died. So many Christians have lost sight of that. They accept the fact they're forgiven in Christ, but from that point, they seek all kinds of work to be made acceptable, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. You're wholly unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. If you continue, there's something for you to do. What do you continue in? Obedience? What do you continue in? Continue in the faith. Isn't that where we started with this subject? That it is by faith? Continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. When God told Abraham he was the father of a great nation, what was the only thing he needed to continue in? Was it in relationship with his wife? Was that what he had to continue in? I mean, that was the key to the whole thing, wasn't it? For he and his wife to produce a baby? No, he didn't continue in that. Lost the ability, both of them. So what did Abraham continue in? Doing calisthenics, taking vitamins, taking, uh, what's that, ginseng? What did he continue doing? He continued in faith and didn't count his own body as part of the equation knowing that body was dead and incapable of producing seed. So what are we to continue in? Continue in faith, ground and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel is not hoping in what God does in me, it's hoping in what is yet to come. He says, verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man all wisdom. He's talking about Christians now. Teaching and warning in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. So see, there's a place for the minister to preach holiness to the congregation. To warn them against sin. There's a place for the preacher to challenge people to walk in holiness and purity and to warn them of the consequences of sin in their own life. There's a place for the preacher to call people to a higher walk and a more holy walk and a more dedicated walk. There's a place for that. The problem is when the preacher lays the burden upon the individual to make preparation in his own soul so that he might become acceptable to God. That's the problem. It's to take the sanctification of God and make it into a work of the flesh. Whereby you labor long and hard to change yourself inside so that you might be an acceptable vessel, empty and sufficiently cleansed of pride and so forth, so that you might be filled. That's a false approach. Now he says in verse 4, This I say, this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. He's warning them. He says, Though I be absent in the flesh, yet I'm with you in spirit, joying, beholding your order, and steadfastness of your, what? Faith in Christ. As you've therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. How do you receive him? By faith. Verse 7, rooted in what faith? Rooted and built up in him. You see, my salvation is rooted in Christ, and the growth of the plant is also based on that rooted in Christ. Rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith. As you've been taught, abounding with thanksgiving, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Now, Paul has got a warning here in the book of Colossians. He's told us about the glorious victory we have in Christ in our position. And he's finally coming to a place to where he says there is a danger for you as a Christian. A grave danger. It's not TV. It's not fornication. It's not witchcraft. It's not false doctrine. What's the great danger? Philosophy. Philosophy. Philosophy is a danger? Yes. This word philosophy, the Greek words also translate principles in the King James Bible. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, through principles, through scientific concepts, through wisdom, through wise ways of approaching God, through wise ways of dealing with the world. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. In other words, those that wisdom of the accumulated ages. Beware lest any man take away, spoil you as a, as a man spoils his enemy and takes away his goods. Beware lest any man spoil you, that is, take away the truth of this gospel and replace it with principles, philosophy, science, psychology. Verse 10, 
for you're complete in him. You don't need anything else. Verse 12, we're buried with him in baptism, risen with him through the faith, the operation of God, and raised him the dead. And you being dead in your sins, uncircumcised, your flesh hath he quickened together, having forgiven your trespasses. Let, verse 16 is another commandment. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink, respect a holy day. In other words, when somebody says you need to keep the Sabbath, don't let them judge you. When somebody says you need to hold Sunday as a holy day, don't let them judge you. When someone says you need to keep the feast days, don't let them judge you. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. And he says, here's another trap, Christians. Don't let anybody get you caught up in the idea of seeking humility. Don't become one of those Christians whose primary focus is to become humble, broken, and empty so you can be filled. Voluntary humility and will worship. Worshiping of angels. And trooding into those things which are not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, that's Jesus, from which all the body and joints, nourishing, ministered, knit together, increases with the increase of God. So in other words, don't let any man beguile you from holding to the head of this body. See, when he says head, he's calling our attention to the fact that we are now one new man in Christ with one single head. And that the body ministers and nourishes itself together, ministers to itself, and this all flows from the head who's in control. So this is simply a warning. Don't let anybody take away from you this sanctification by faith. This victory that you have in Christ by diverting your mind off to principles and philosophy and science and psychology and the rudiments of the world. Instead of you being connected to the head and living a life of constant life flowing from the head. He says, why are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, and handle not. In other words, why do you follow an ordinance like don't eat shrimp or catfish? Why do you follow ordinances like abstain from sex from so many days after your wife's period? Why do you follow ordinances like keeping the Sabbath holy or tithing? Why do you follow ordinances, those things that were given to the Old Testament Jews? Why do you base your Christianity on the ordinances instead of letting it be something that flows from life? You see, Paul was radical compared to the, today's Christian. Next chapter, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. There's another commandment. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection, there's a commandment, on things above. So, can you see Paul's commandments all have to do with our reflection and response to that reality? Then he says, verse 5, mortify therefore your members. We covered that last week, so we won't deal with that again. But we mortify our members simply by reckoning ourselves to be dead. Verse 8. But now ye also put off all these. Tells you to put off something. Put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, and so forth. Now, how do you put them off? Why? What's our, what's our motivation and our power to put off these things? How do I stop being angry? How do I stop having wrath? How do I stop my bitterness and my filthy communication? Verse 9. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. In other words, I can stop being angry because I have the assurance that I no longer have an old man. I can stop being angry because the old man that is being angry right now doesn't exist anymore in God's reckoning. Because in God's reckoning, the man who's lustful has died in Christ 2,000 years ago and dead men can't lust. Now we've already covered that thorough enough. We will not need to go through that again. But in other words... My point here this morning is this, that all that God commands the Christian to do is a reflection of what he's already done to us in Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. All of it is a life flowing out of a reality. Never is it us creating a reality. Now he says, verse 12, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. Put on charity. 15, let the peace of God rule in your heart. 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and admonishing, teaching one another. Verse 17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, provoke not your children. Servants, 
Obey your masters. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. So there's a whole chapter full of commandments for what a Christian is supposed to do. And all of it springs out of that reality that the old man who would sin is dead and the new man in Jesus Christ is the only man that exists and it's by faith that I reckon that to be true. It's by faith that I live in that reality instead of the reality I see which is the carnal man. And as I live in God's reality by no effort of mine, just faith. Then I walk after the Spirit, as you said in Romans chapter 8. If you walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh, he said in Galatians, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, he said what the law could not do, Romans 8, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So what God has called me to do now, now that I have this new reality, God has called me to walk in it. Walk in the light. God has called me to walk in this light. Walk in this reality. In other words, take a step of faith and say, this flesh cannot lust. It's dead. Take a step of faith. Abraham said, I'm the father of a great nation. I'm looking for a city which has foundations, who's builder and maker of God. His wife took a step of faith and said, as old as I am, she said, I'm going to have a child. Never have had, but I'm going to have a child. He said, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off and persuaded of them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So all God asks us to do in response to his reality is to confess, to embrace, confess and embrace, just to pass our empty vessel over to him. Now I have all kinds of books where they talk about how you get that ves vessel empty. Had Amish fella come up to me about two weeks ago in a meeting. And I'd been preaching two hours, looking right at him. He came up and he looked miserable. I mean, you never seen anybody look so miserable in your life. He said, you know, I, I, how do you know if you're saved? I said, you don't need to wonder, you're not. He said, well, you know, I just, I just, can't, I just can't have any assurance. He said, I try, I've tried, I've tried, I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed. I just can't have any assurance I'm saved. And I said, you know, what you're doing is this. I said, you're taking this box that says on it, my good works, my faithfulness, my life, and you're emptying it out. And you're emptying it out of self-effort. You're emptying it out of pride. You're emptying it out of your goodness. You're emptying it out of everything that a person normally brings to God. And now you have an empty box, a box that shows that you're not trusting in anything at all. And then you're coming to God with your empty box and you're laying it down in front of him. And you're saying, God, I want to come to you and I want your grace and mercy because I don't have anything to offer you. And you open your little empty box and you say, see, I come without anything to commend me to you. I come totally lost. God says, I'm sorry. We can't receive you here. You're too proud. And you say, well, I, I knew it was. I knew that was a problem. And you go away. And for a year, you work on your pride and you humble yourself and you work on your faith and you come back to God again after having cleaned that box out on the inside. And you say, God, see, I know I've been proud. I know I've been haughty. I know I've been unbelieving. Here's my empty box. Now, won't you save me? God says, I'm sorry. We only save sinners here. So, but God, I'm a sinner. I wouldn't come if I wasn't a sinner. Yeah, but you're not enough of one. Sorry, go away. And he goes away. He said, he interrupted me. He said, you know what? He said, my daddy did that for years. He finally gave up. He's an old man now. And he says, there's no way that you can know you're saved in this life. Because you can never be quite sure that you're empty enough, trusting enough, believing enough, broken enough, and enough of a sinner there's always a little pride left there. And he said, he is lost right now. And that's where he is. I said, yep, and that's where you're headed. And the fellow just looked stricken, man. He looked like, he looked like Job. He just totally miserable. This guy just was empty. And I gave him the gospel once again. I said, listen, it's not what God has done in you or what you do in yourself. I said, I'll tell you what, here's a better thing. Come to God with your box full of pride. Come to God with your box full of lust. 
Come to God with your box full of anger. Come to him with your box full of bitterness and say, God, this stinking thing is damning me and I can't do a thing about it. I need some salvation. Amen. He says, okay, I'm in the business of saving sinners. Give me that thing. And he takes your old box of sin and he deals with it. You see what the Amish fellow was doing? He was dealing with his sin so God could receive him. And I said, I said, you know, in the community where I live, the Amish people think I'm proud because I say I know I'm saved. He said, yeah, that's what they think. I said, why do, why do they think I'm proud for saying I know I'm saved? He said, because they think that you're saying that, that where they haven't been able to get humble enough and broken enough and lost enough, that you're saying you have done all those things. So it, it's, it's an act of bragging to confess that you are in a condition of heart where God could save you. I said, exactly. I said, now, do you think I'm proud? I just preached the gospel to him. I said, do you think I'm proud when I say that Jesus Christ is my righteousness? He said, no. No, I, I can say you're not. I can say that you're just saying that Jesus is the Savior and, and you're relying completely on him. Now, most of you can see clearly on what I just said. You say, I agree with that. I can see where he's all messed up. I can see he's all wrong. I, I've talked to some of them. I can see where they... I have a book called Three of a Child. You could consult. <laughs> Rachel, you could use it. Uh, you, you can say, I can see all that. I can understand that. I, I can see how they're all messed up. But do you realize that most of the Christians are doing the same thing with sanctification? Yeah. They're saying, I know I need this empty vessel filled with the Holy Spirit and the power of God. But I'm too proud. I got too much lust. I'm too worldly minded, too carnally minded. I'm just not ready yet. I got to, I got to pray some more. I got to fast. And people start making effort to clean out the vessel so they can bring it to God and say, okay, God, see, as a Christian, I'm ready to be filled. I'm ready to worship. I'm ready to have it happen. I want the anointing now. God says, I'm sorry, you, you'll have to get your own anointing. You did everything else. But God, I just want to be filled. God says, no, that's not, that's not the way we work. You see, the problem is not your empty box. The problem is you, the guy carrying it. The problem is you and the only way I've got of dealing with you is to kill you. I execute sinners. Well, God, I've tried to die to myself. <laughs> you had not done too good a job. You wouldn't be standing here jawing before me. But God, I've prayed long. Yeah, I get tired of hearing you pray too. But God, I've asked for the anointing. All you want to do is get happy and have fun. But God, what do I do? Hey, I said in the book, I've already done it. I not only died for you, I crucified you, I buried you, I raised you from the dead. I'm simply asking you to believe me and be strengthened with might by my power in the inner man and walk after the spirit, not after your flesh. But God, how can I walk after the spirit when this flesh is crying out and wants to be fulfilled? Don't walk after it, walk after the spirit. But God, how can I walk after the spirit till I deal with the flesh? Look, I already dealt with the flesh. I told you that. I put the flesh to death. But God, I can't see it. Oh, get him out of here. <laughs> Don't you see? It's the same thing that the Amish are trying to get saved. Many of you are trying for sanctification. You say, okay, I, I, you, you convince me. Like, what do I do tomorrow morning then? What do I do tomorrow morning? I usually get up grouchy. Kids make me grouchy. I hate to go to work. I listen to the country music on the way to work and it makes me lustful. How do I deal with all this? Tomorrow morning when you get up, just say, Lord, good morning. I thank you. You're alive and on the throne and in control. And I bless you. You're a holy God. See, I can't do that because I feel so bad about myself. Oh, I'll go back to bed then. Listen, we're talking about... We're talking about a different reality here from self. God, I bless you. I thank you. And then whenever you go in and sit down to the breakfast table and your wife is, looks awful or smells awful or cooks awful or didn't cook at all, still in bed, you know, instead of getting mad at her, just say, well, dead men don't eat anyhow. 
They don't have to eat, do they? And, and, and so what's a little, and thank God I'm dead. I can eat this anyhow. Now, I don't always do this. I'm just telling you, you need to do it. And say, you know, dead men are dead. And then when you're on the way and you, you want to turn that radio on, listen to some kind of whining, crying, and boo. The other day we were thumbing through, listening for, uh, looking for some news, and Ricky's right along with me. And we hit one of those uh, country channels, you know, and uh, where this uh, booze and tears song, and Ricky leaned over and said, pour me a cold one. <laughs> <laughs> brought back old memories, you know. <laughs> and uh, so when you just say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm dead to this. You say, but I like the beat, man. I like the beat. I just want to get to feel the beat. Makes me kind of wakes me up in the morning to feel the beat, you know. And, and a little beer on the way home, that kind of, you know, kind of gives me a good feeling there. A little cigarette. I need that. Uh, whatever it is that comes in your flesh, don't fight it. Don't deal with it. Thank God that it's dead. You say, but when I thank God that it's dead, will it, will it go away? No, it won't go away. But you won't walk after it. It won't go away, but you won't have to do it. It won't go away, but you'll walk after the Spirit and you'll find such joy and fellowship in walking after the Spirit. You'll find such life flowing that all that flesh will be forgotten. And a peace will settle over you and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, he said. And as you walk after that Spirit, walk in communion with God. The voice of the flesh will become distant. You'll hardly hear it. It will recede. It'll always be there the rest of your life, the voice of the flesh. It'll cry out, and if you listen, if you stop to listen, you can hear it. But in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm dead to that voice. I'm alive to God, and it recedes into the backgrounds and the deep shadows. It waits for you to get defeated, broken, fearful, anxious. It waits for you to, get, to forget God and stop walking by faith. And the flesh will come back out of the darkness. And it'll loom up big before you. And it'll lie to you and tell you you're not dead. And Satan will tell you you've got to have this beer, this dope, this cigarette, this whatever it is. And you can believe it and you can go back and walk after the flesh. In which case you'll die. Or you can say, no, I reckon myself to be dead to this. I'm alive to God. I'm free. And once again, the flesh recedes. Why? Because in God's reckoning, that flesh is dead. And that's what you must do. All right, that concludes our discussion on sanctification by faith. So from now on, none of us will sin. Amen. <laughs>